Oh, hey. How you guys been? Wait a minute. Who are you? Anyhow, it's the new year, and that means we get to do one of my favorite things all year, and that is looking ahead to see who the best new talents are. Last year, we had a really great run with our picks. More about that here in a second. But yeah, I think this is one of the biggest questions you can ask. Who's really great that has potential to be champion here soon and a major player in the top 10 of their division? So let's take a look. I'm Jason from MMA on Point, and these are my 10 biggest new UFC prospects for 2022. So a couple of things to address. By the way, if you want to miss out on my whole criteria spiel, skip to 255. There's a lot to cover. Number one, my criteria. A fighter has to A, have at least fought once in the UFC to be eligible. As we know, the bright lights can change a lot for people. B, they can't already be in the top 10 of their divisions. As much as I want to talk about somebody like Tom Aspinall on this list, I can't because he's already in the top 10. C, they can't have already been featured on our list before. They have to be new as the title suggests, which leads me to this whole discussion. Last year, we had a pretty damn good year with forecasting some of the next major talents. We featured 15 people on the 2021 list, as we will on this year's because there are just way too many good names out there. But of the 15 from last year, only two lost with Song Yadong and Jamal Hill. Unfortunately, we didn't see Otman Azaitar following his weird espionage bag incident despite being reinstated. I have no idea what the hell happened there, but nor did we see Kuta Taladze, but the rest all performed really well with many moving into title contention this year. So why won't I be including them again? Well, many have simply moved into the top 10 for one, and for the ones who have not, I just wouldn't be saying anything new that I didn't already say last year. Would honestly feel lazy to me to just feature a lot of the same guys. So I would recommend watching last year's video if you want to know why I'm so high on them. Links are in the description. And the last Last housekeeping note, there seems to be a whole disambiguation about the term quote unquote prospect. Basically, all it means is a fighter that has a ton of potential that is yet to be capitalized on who is not yet in title contention. And for the sake of this video, I basically mean people that are about to become a force in the top 10 and have real title potential. If you think top 15 is too high, I mean, just look at boxing with the ring magazine. Teofima Lopez was literally listed as prospect of the year in 2018, which is the same year he won won his first world title in July. What I'm doing with top 15 is much further back than that. Anyhow, the point is it's all over the place and there are several definitions to prospect. For me, I'm defining it as simple as title slash divisional prospects. All right, preamble over. So on to number 15, Umar Nurmagomedov at Bantamweight. If you didn't already get the hint from that large disclaimer section, narrowing down these prospects is incredibly difficult because they are all so good. But you have to start somewhere, and Umar's undefeated record is as good a place as any to begin. So obviously you know Habib Nurmagomedov, well here's his cousin Umar. And while he certainly does live up to the family name, he is very good on the ground, mind you. But what he really likes to do is stand up and contend on the feet. More Zabit-like quote unquote is everybody he says, his kicking game is a true marvel and he even used it to set up his thrilling rear naked choke finish in his UFC debut. He's undefeated with experience in PFL and Fight Nights Global, and despite only having one single fight in the promotion, you just felt like you were watching something special in his debut. He's that good. Some fighters just show their potential from the beginning, and he was one of them. All this was enough to get him a fight booked with Jack Shore, a move way up the ladder mind you, but he was forced to pull out for an undisputed closed reason, still not sure why as it's recent news, but the fact that they were looking to book him against somebody so well known as a prospect like Jack Shore this fast pretty much tells you everything you need to know. The name alone will sell with Nurmagomedov, but the talent here is real. Number 14, Andre Muniz, middleweight. Most will remember him for his unforgettable submission over Jacare, who is not only an MMA legend, but a BJJ master. As a result, I'll probably never forgive him for what he did, but I am forced to respect it. He's already got six wins in the UFC, he's on an eight fight win streak extending back to 2016, and he submitted everyone in four out of his last six fights. It's actually pretty crazy it took him this long to get here with 22 fights outside of the UFC and all in Brazil prior to Dana White's 
contender series, which can easily be seen as an asset for his career. He has all the experience in the world, but not against a shark tank the entire time with insanely tough fights for every single outing. So he's walking to the UFC a crafty veteran without any issues of being shop worn, and it shows. But as you probably guessed, this guy is a submission animal with 15 career submissions, and he's very aggressive chasing after it. You factor in his Muay Thai experience, this guy is a force to be reckoned with anywhere the fight takes place. He's currently ranked at number 13. And number 13 on this list, Jeff Molina, flyweight. Fighters don't get much more exciting to watch than this guy. He's recently just made his UFC debut in 2021 with two wins to his name, but he's on a nine fight streak overall where he's only lost the very beginning of his career at 10 and two overall. And he only has two decisions in that entire time going back for five years. And in a division like flyweight where it used to have a reputation of more decisions, his high finish rate usually in the first round is a pretty welcome thing. And when he does does have decisions, they are literally fight of the nights where he drops his opponents multiple times. He's super sharp on the feet with crisp boxing, has a ton of submissions to his name. You partner all that raw talent with the fact that he trains one of the best coaches in the entire sport, James Krause. It's hard not to be hyped about this 24 year old unranked prospect. As of now, he doesn't have a fight booked, but judging by his Twitter account, he's looking at a return in April in Brooklyn. Number 12, Shavkat Romanov, welterweight. If you want to talk about a guy who makes fighting look easy, this is just one of the best examples you'll ever see. In both of Romanov's UFC outings, he came out unblemished and nearly untouched. I mean, the height difference with Prezeris was practically unfair, and Alex Oliveira is an incredibly tough test for a debut, but he made it look like it was just another day at the office. He's 14-0, and an M1 veteran who left the promotion, still as a defending welterweight champion, and he literally doesn't have a single decision on his record and equals seven subs and seven KO slash TKOs. He's a sniper on the feet matched with a quicksand like grappling game. At the moment, he's currently unranked and is already booked in his next fight with fellow prospect Carlston Harrison, who's also undefeated in the UFC on February 5th. But trust me, he won't be just a hardcore fan favorite for very long. Number 11, Melissa Gatto, flyweight. In prospect videos of the past, there have been themes. Last year, there was the Georgian invasion, for instance. But this year, here, it's the women's flyweights. And Melissa Gatto is part of that new class of fighters in the division that could very soon start making the lackluster title picture very interesting. She's a lifelong martial artist who's been training since the age of eight years old. She's definitely a powerhouse with BJJ on the grounds and plenty of submissions, but she's also a killer on the feet, being the first person to ever stop Sajar Eubanks, who herself was once a title contender at 125. Gatto's also got a ton of boxing experience, and it's something that shows in her fights. Basically, she's dangerous everywhere and considering how wide open women's flyweight currently is, we could easily see her jump into the rankings over the next year. Number 10, Lerone Murphy, featherweight. It's really rare nowadays to see a fighter in the UK make it to the UFC without going through cage warriors first, yet that's exactly what Lerone Murphy has done. But in case you haven't noticed, this guy is just a through and through finisher. He's got some serious power, speed, and the ability to adjust in the middle of a fight like his last one with Makawan Amir Khani where he was controlled in the first round before a absolutely thunderous knee early in the second round on a takedown attempt. Oh, and he made his debut on short notice in Abu Dhabi against Habib Nurmagomedov's famed 229 fellow brawler and teammate Zubaira Tuhugov and still managed to get a draw out of that situation. He's currently 11-0 and unranked, but that absolutely will not remain the case if he can get just a couple fights this year. We had him in the studio for our fight companion in December, and he said he's looking to get on the forecasted London card in March, something I think we'd all like to see for the 11-0 prospect. Oh, and a major detail of his story, if you didn't already know, is that the man was shot in the face walking out of a barber shop in 2013. Oh, man. You apparently just can't hurt this guy at all. Number nine, Casey O'Neill, flyweight. What do you get when you cross Scottish with Australian? One of the weirdest accents you'll ever hear. I played football when I was 
football. Yeah. Football, <laughs> soccer here. Yeah. An apparently gleaming level of talent. Casey has a wealth of experience going back to her amateur days in Queensland with Eternal MMA stretching back to 2014. Her career was so well known with that promotion that in her pro debut, she immediately went into a five round title fight and won. Being the daughter of a kickboxer, she's been training literally since the age of four. And oh yeah, I forgot to mention she took her first amateur fight when she was only 16. She's now 24 and just an absolute dog of a fighter. Undefeated in eight pro fights, including a win over Valentina's sister Antonina. And I would say that she has a pace that might get into a bit of trouble in the first round, which we usually see, but once it makes it to the second, her pace absolutely drowns her opponents and her ground and pound smothering style just takes over. Her last four fights have essentially gone all this route, and as I mentioned, only being 24 with a cardio intensive game like this, her ceiling feels like it's not nearly being met. She's just barely cracked the top 15 at number 15 and will be facing Roxanne Modafferi on February 12th. I'd say it's her first big test, but that Antonina fight really was already, and she passed that with absolutely flying colors. Number 8, Movzar Ivloyev, Featherweight. And the undefeated records continue on this list with this time a Russian whose reputation has already begun to precede him. He's currently 15-0 with 5 UFC wins to his name already since joining the UFC. This was back in 2019 and he's also begun training with American Top Team. Before making it over, he's already been a champion then at 135 with M1 where he was pretty much their golden boy as he never fought anywhere else until going right into the UFC. And he's got the style you would expect out of that region with a wrestling heavy smothering style where his focus is actually based in Greco-Roman. Randy Couture is no doubt smiling somewhere I'm sure. Despite that, he's got a strong jab and bloodies many of his opponents on the feet. And with names like Nick Lentz where he showed an amazing ability to escape deep submission attempts and push the pace as well as besting Hakeem Dawadu where his chin got tested late, his composure is pretty much unflappable. The only problem is He's up against one of the top prospects from last year's list who is super dangerous and also undefeated, and that is Ilya Taporia at UFC 270, which is no doubt my favorite fight outside of the two title fights on that entire card. We are really talking about the future of the division here with Movzar, and at only age 26 with Taporia at 24, this is a real toss up. He's currently ranked at number 13. Number 7, Aaron Blanchfield, Flyweight. Back in with another Flyweight standout in Blanchfield who is about as talented as it gets. She's already got wins over Kay Hansen and a shutout performance over former Invicta champion where she absolutely dominated and controlled Miranda Maverick. And although she was not given the decision, I feel she did beat Tracy Cortez. You can even hear the commentator saying that just after their fight. I think you gotta lean towards Aaron Blanchfield. She controlled more of the third round, but first round saw Tracy Cortez battle an armbar that she was locked in for literally minutes. Either way, she was only 18 back then and now she's just 22. She's super strong with an ability to smother and submit her opponents on the canvas or land beautiful head kicks to finish things on the feet. On top of that, she's actually won an Eddie Bravo Invitational Championship and she's trained at Henzo Gracie Academy, but she's been doing kickboxing and competing in tournaments all before age 10. She really feels like one of those next gen talents and that's in part due to the fact that she declared herself a future MMA champ at only 12 years old. Based Basically, she's been preparing for this her entire life. She's a super exciting fighter, and I'll mention this at least one more time, flyweight is a wide open division that's just begging for new challengers to the throne. Expect her to climb the division quickly despite just two wins in the UFC and not being ranked at the moment. She is currently 8-1, with again the only loss being at age 18 that I personally thought she won, considering she just fought a couple of weeks ago, she's not booked just yet, but I'd bet that we'll see her again before the summer. Number six, Armin Sarukian, lightweight. In a sport where losses can sometimes be treated like a scarlet letter, it really says something when a loss becomes an indelible moment that showcases potential and frankly overshadows the loss itself. Of course, I'm talking about Armin's incredible debut against Islam Mahajev, where he gave Islam his best challenge in the last six years. Talk about aging well considering the title implications that Mahajev now is around. But Sarukian was only 22 back then and five years younger than Islam. Since then, he's gone on a four fight win streak at 17 and two overall with his most emphatic UFC win against Christos Yagos coming back in September. 
but he's not just a grappler or a wrestler by any means despite his master of sport credentials in wrestling, but he's got some killer finishes on the feet as well from the indie circuit that showcase his ability to finish anywhere the fight goes. He's next booked against the towering 6'3 fellow prospect 155er Joel Alvarez on February 22nd, but yeah, this is an absolute banger and a fight to mark on your calendar without a doubt. Sarukian is currently ranked at number 13 in the lightweight division. Number 5, Adrian Yanez, Bantamweight. This is a fighter we've talked about a fair amount on the channel throughout the last year and for good reason. There aren't many more dangerous prospects out there with as much unrelenting killer instinct than this heavy-handed boxer. But don't let the sound of that fool you, he's incredibly technically gifted with a Golden Gloves honor to his name and a sharp-witted ability to adapt like he did against Randy Costa after a very tough first round. I mean, he's also got a BJJ black belt to stack on top of all of that. But his real story is his big KO power. He seemingly just got that touch of death and has finished all but three of his wins with nine knockouts and two submissions. And his last fight was a particularly tough one considering it came after the loss of his father figure, mentor, and coach, Saul Salise. But it also showed his ability to persevere under extreme grief and duress. He's currently 28 with a 15-3 record on an 8-fight win streak and 4 UFC wins since debuting in 2020. Most recently, he's been calling for a fight with Sean O'Malley, so needless to say, he's definitely got big plans for this year, and he's ready for a huge test. At the moment, he's still not ranked at Bantamweight, but I would expect to see that change in just a fight or two. Number 4, Manon Fior. Flyweight. Finally, we are at the end of this insane list of women's flyweight prospects. But as the countdown suggests, we tend to save the best for last. And man, what a killer this woman is. Despite being 8 and 1, nothing about her record truly communicates just how devastating she is on the feet. She's won 3K1 kickboxing championships, is a Muay Thai champion, a karate black belt, BJJ purple belt, and was also an amateur champ with the IMAFs, which is the absolute best predictor for a European talent to come up through the sport. But on top of all of that, as if that's all somehow not impressive enough, she's also competed in Cage Warriors. She was an EFC champion in South Africa, a UAE Warriors champion, and finished all but two of her opponents with a super aggressive striking game. Even in her decision, she manages to put together masterclass striking that bludgeoned her opponents. I mean, that Bueno Silva fight, geez. Again, she's also qualified on the ground with a BJJ purple belt, and as of now, she's still just 31 and is just now breaking into the rankings at number 14. I cannot overemphasize enough how much this new crop of talent is needed at 125, and this impressive style and ability to finish like few others, she'll move up super quickly in the division. She's got her first big name talent matchup against Jessica I, which should be nothing short of a showcase on March 5th. Number three, Mateusz Gamrot. Lightweight. Similar to Ryzen's former flyweight champ Manel Kopp, I want to say Cape so bad, how dare they change the pronunciation after watching his career for so long. Mateusz is a former double KSW champion, had a bit of a weird start to his UFC run with a loss to one of my top prospects from last year, Guram Kutataladze, but he's since rebounded with an incredible 2021. And it could not have gone much better with astounding finishes over vets like Scott Holtzman, Carlos Diego Fajaya, and Jeremy Stevens. Prior to his UFC run, he was undefeated as the KSW lightweight and featherweight champ, who also has ADCC, NAGA, and grappling championships to his name. And going back through his KSW record, he's always been an exciting fighter with plenty of finishes. Even in that lone loss to Kutataladze, it was incredibly close, and it was a split decision. His last three wins have proven that it's not much of a setback at all, and if he can manage three more fights this year in a similar fashion, he'll jump up that ladder super quick. Speaking of which, He's already moved up to 12 in the rankings and is predicting he could even be up for title contention by 2023. His record stands at 20 and 1. Number 2, Drikas Duplessis, remember the name. The invasion of the former KSW champs continues in this entry with the South African native who is 2 and 0 in the UFC with two beautiful striking showcase finishes. He's also won belts in two different weight classes with EFC in South Africa at both welterweight and middleweight in addition to a big one beating perhaps the scariest fighter outside of the UFC right now in Roberto Soldich or as he's known 
Robocop. The guy just kills everybody and Duplessis finished him with a huge left hook after nearly choking him out in the first round. He did end up losing the rematch before coming to the UFC, but basically he forced Saldich to change his entire style by punishing his aggression and forcing a more methodical approach in the rematch. And that's where you've got to mention Duplessis' chin. My god, this guy perhaps has an even better affinity for taking punches than he does for giving them. And you can thank his K1 amateur and semi-pro championship titles for his striking prowess. And so you may or may not be surprised to learn that while his 15-2 record has no decisions, he actually has more submission wins than KOs and TKOs. He is only just now about to turn 28 on the 14th of January, and the middleweight division is totally wide open with a dominant champion like Isra Adesanya and Robert Whittaker firmly at the top with few challengers on the horizon. Just a couple more wins like the last two could easily find him ready for title contention by the year's end, if not the top five. He's recently been tied to a matchup with fellow prospect Andre Muniz, but had to pull out due to a shoulder injury and subsequent surgery. He is currently not ranked at middleweight. All right, so before I get to the final entry, it's time to talk about the honorable mentions. Holy shit, this was a tough year. Certainly far too much great talent, but there's a lot left on the cutting room floor. While some of this is being shown already as I'm talking, I do have to dive in a bit further with some of the names that people are expecting. While many probably expected Cage Warrior vets like Ian Gary and Patty Pimblett on this list for good reason, as they are both incredible prospects in their own right and friends of the channel, their debuts frankly saw almost as much danger as it did triumph. Still great prospects by all means, and they each have huge star potential, especially in Patty's case already with his followers and views and everything. And then time for me to be a huge contrarian. Everybody wants to see Manel Cape, Cop, however you want to say his last name. I prefer to say Cape, damn it. I get it. I'm a huge fan of him and Ryzen. It would feel great to see him on this list, but the inconsistency has to be talked about. He was 4-3 and three when he left Ryzen, he's currently 2-2 two and two in the UFC, and even though those wins looked great, Zuma Gulov is just one out of his last four, and Osborne is 2-2 two and two as of late. Again, a terrific prospect, deserves all the recognition, but just not enough to be on this list. Another one is Alex Pereira, who I really wanted to put on this list, but when it comes down to it, he's 4-1. Great prospects, just a little too early for me. Quickly mentioning a couple of other ones, Terrence McKinney is another huge prospect that deserves recognition, but on the side of consistency has rough losses from 2019. Daniel Rodriguez is a personal favorite of mine, but recently lost to Dalby. Joel Alvarez, the weight cut issue in his past two fights makes me question if 155 is even his true weight class. And finally, Sean O'Malley, who at number 11 had an incredible comeback here, but he's by no means a new prospect. He's been well known for years. Lastly, double check my disclaimer where I listed last year's prospects, so I don't think they're getting slighted if I didn't list them again this year. Check that first before commenting. I just thought it would be lazy to list so many guys from last year. And of course they have to at least had a fight in the UFC. Anyhow, on to number one, Rafael Faziv lightweight. In a perennially stacked division like 155, it should be no surprise at all that the rankings are very difficult to break into, but I'm still taken back a little bit when I see Fazeev is just at number 11. Yes, he didn't have a particularly great UFC introduction with a devastating loss back in 2019, but the wins he's had since then in the way he's earned them against names like Moicano, Bobby Green, and Brad Riddell, the latter as a co-main event even, just shows that this 28-year-old is only now coming into his own. He's got an outstanding striking background with Tiger Muay Thai and multiple international championships spanning well over a decade in the art. He's currently training with Henry Hooft and many other top talents at Sanford MMA, which only began this last year that will surely improve his game overall. And yeah, the man's got seven KO TKOs throughout his 11-1 career that began in 2015. He'll very easily break into the top 10 with even just one more win, and he's recently been calling out RDA for the title of best. Rafael Rafael in the division, which he is ready for in February despite having just fought last month. He's number one on my list. Hopefully I didn't piss too many people off this year. Thanks so much for watching guys. Make sure to like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video. We do at least three videos a week so you'll get decent value out of it and comment below if you think the video sucked. You probably did. You probably disagreed with all my picks. You can follow me on Twitter at JasonTheHeart on Twitter or on Point MMA. See you guys later.